All right, so anyway, just want to welcome everybody in person online, and I want to pick up with what we were talking about last Sunday, about, uh, we, about what, the, what is the Spirit saying to the church? What is the Spirit saying to this church? Uh, so if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 3, 1 through 6. I'm going to read this, um, read this passage of Scripture as we absorb, okay, Lord, what are you speaking? Lord, what are you saying? And Lord, I just, I do pray even as we're turning there, Lord, I ask you to uh, capture our hearts, Lord. I pray that we would capture, we would sense, Lord, what the heart of Jesus is saying to the church, to this church, Lord, we pray. And so, Lord, I just pray, give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in this hour we live in. On, on this day, we pray in Jesus' name. So the Lord's writing to the church of Sardis, and he says, To the angel of the church of Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. And I don't think the Lord is saying to Restoration Life that we're dead. I think the Lord is, there's some things in here that the Lord wants to emphasize, but I don't believe the Lord's saying we're dead. He, I do believe he is saying to wake up to the hour of history we're living in, to wake up to what is going on around us, to, to really wake up to the urgency of the hour that we're living in the end times, that Jesus really is coming back soon. And he says in verse 2, wake up. And strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. Now, I'm going to really focus on that part of the scripture and this message to strengthen those things that remain that were about to die. I don't feel like things are about to die, but I, I believe it's like the Lord is saying to us, strengthen the local church so that we can fulfill the mission God has given to us. That's really what I believe the Lord is saying. In the urgency of the hour we live in, strengthen the local church. There, there's nothing more important in the day and the hour we live in, to then to strengthen the local church. Strengthen the local church. Isaiah talks about strength is in the cluster. That, you know, the Lord talked about in Matthew or in, uh, John chapter 15, that I, that I am the vine, you are the branches. It's not just one branch, it's branches, it's a vineyard. The church is meant to be the Lord's vineyard. It's not just to be one branch that you and Jesus are serving independently. The church is meant to be a vineyard of, of many branches abiding in the vine together. Now, you do that first yourself, but together we're abiding in the vine. The church is vitally important in the hour we're living in as, as we approach the second coming of Jesus. So the Lord says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain. I'm just going to say this to our church. Strengthen the local church. Wake up, strengthen the local church because, you know, the Lord said then things, because I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. I would say it like this to us. Strengthen the local church because you have a vital end time ministry and mandate that you must fulfill. And we haven't fulfilled it yet. All right? So that's what I believe the Lord is really wanting to stress to us, that strengthen the local church strengthen that so we can fulfill our mission and our mandate. So that is really what this message is about. So what I'm going to do in this message, I'm going to quickly go through, if you've read my book, The Eternal Blueprint, you're going to, this is a review, and you probably have heard this message from us many times, but um, I just want to go through real quick the five components of God's eternal purpose so we can better understand our mission. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remind us Okay, this is our mission. Now, probably every one of us, hopefully, I don't want to even ask because it might, might discourage me, but hopefully every one of us knows what our mission is, and I'm going to just remind us, just to stir us up by way of reminder. Number three, I want to talk about how when we fulfill our mission, it helps fulfill God's eternal purpose. And then number four, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the different areas that the Lord wants us to strengthen the different areas the Lord wants us to strengthen so that we can complete our mission. So that's where we're going in this message. And so I'm going to just talk really quick about God's eternal purpose. And I listed five components of God's eternal purpose in the Eternal Blueprint book that I've, as I've searched the scriptures, when I say eternal purpose, what I mean is like what God purposed before time and creation. It's the reason why God created mankind. It's the reason why we exist. We exist because this is what God wants. He established this before time and creation. Number one is that Jesus will be the center of everything in heaven and on earth. 
That's why we sang that song. Jesus, be the center of our lives. Be the center of your church. That, you know, if you look around, I would not say Jesus is at the center of a lot of churches. But God will have a people before he returns that he is the center of all things. And it talks about in Ephesians chapter 1 that God's eternal purpose is to bring everything, and to, to bring it under the headship of Jesus Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. The second thing of God's eternal purpose, the second component of God's eternal purpose is the Father will have a family of Christ-like sons. Jesus is the pattern son. God the Father will have a family of Christ-like, mature, spirit-led sons before the Lord comes back. Romans chapter 8 makes it very clear that, the, that all creation is groaning and longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That's not just meaning for those who are saved. It means those who have come unto full maturity and re represent the Lamb of God in His exact nature. God is going to have a people like that before He comes back. Number three, the Son is going to have an equally yoked bride. The Son is going to have a bride who is in love with Him. Number four, the Holy Spirit will have a temple and a house and a body that He possesses and fills fully. And then number five, believers have been invited into eternal intimacy, eternal authority, and eternal glory. That's, that's the five components of God's eternal purpose. And if you want to read more about that, just read about it in the eternal blueprint. There's a lot to say about that. But I, you know, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into all of that. But just to say this, I want to say now, our mission, I want to talk about our mission. What is our mission? Our mission is the why. Our mission is the why. It's the why we exist as a ministry, as a church. Why do we exist? And, you know, if you've been here for a while, you know this, but it's Luke 1, 17. This is the mission God has given us. Talking about <clears throat> John the Baptist, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So our mission, our mission is to make ready God's people in this community, in this nation, and in the nations, to make them ready for the Lord and for his return. Now, you know that. We said it a, a billion times. And so I did, but, it, but it's good to remind ourselves, this is why we exist. This is why we're here. We're not here just to fill up two hours on a Sunday morning. There's a lot better things we could do than just fill up two hours. We are here because we are on a mission to fulfill God's eternal purpose. We are on a mission to make God's people ready, this church ready, ourselves ready, those in, in this nation, those in this community, those in the nations of the earth. God has called us as a forerunner ministry to make the church ready. That is our mission. That is our mandate. That is what God has told us to do. That is why the why we exist. We exist because of this very thing. So I just want to go through real quickly and talk about when we fulfill our mission to make ready God's people, when we fulfill that mission to make ready God's people, how it will fulfill God's eternal purpose. Number one is when we fulfill our mission, we will place Jesus at the center of the church. I think if you look around right now, you realize so many things have eclipsed Jesus Christ and his church. Good things. Things of God. But see, Jesus is not competing with the things of God. Jesus wants to be the very center. We've placed the things of Christ above Christ himself, the person. We've exalted things, good things that are in the word of God. Good things like revival and evangelism, discipleship and Israel, and the end times, and the gifts of the Spirit, and doctrine and theology, spiritual warfare, worship, leadership principles, cultural relevance, so many different things in the church of Jesus Christ have been placed into the center, and Jesus has been eclipsed by the things of, by the things of God. Now, what I've found is when, when Jesus Christ is at the center, all of those other things I just mentioned, which are very, very important, come into alignment, into proper alignment. And so the, that's what Paul's urgent message was to the book of, in the book of Colossians is to place Jesus Christ back into the center of his church. 
And I believe before the Lord returns, Jesus will become the center focus in his house. Not the things of God, though those things will be in operation, the gifts of the Spirit, doctrine, theology, all those things are vital and important. Our mission, as we make God's people ready, our mission is to place Christ at the center of this church and to be a voice to the global church to place Christ back at the center of his church. That is our mission, is that Jesus would have preeminence in his house once again. Amen. Number two, our mission is to equip the church to be overcoming sons of God. Right now, I would not describe the church of Jesus Christ as overcoming sons of God. The church, by and large, much of the church, is immature, selfish, and childish. Nevertheless, before the Lord returns, he is going to have a mature, a mature church, a church that is a, an, an, a, a mature representation of Jesus Christ, conformed into his image. The, the nature of the Lamb, the humility, the meekness, the self-sacrifice, the obedience of Jesus Christ, he is going to have a people who have been conformed into that image before he comes back. And so that is, what, that is one of our missions, is to help the Lord have that family of corporate sons that he can say over, these are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. All creation is longing and groaning for this revelation. And our goal, our mission is to help see that come about. Our mission is to equip the, this church and to equip the global church to be overcoming sons of God who overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Number three is that we have a mission in making the people of God ready. We have a mission to make the bride of Christ ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Again, the church today, if you read Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, if you read through that, you realize the church today is not much different at all than the church of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. We've lost our first love, and I'm just speaking about the global church by and large. We've lost our first love. We are, uh, we're not faithful to the Lord to follow him wherever he goes. We're, we're compromised by false doctrines, by Jezebel. We're, we're asleep in the urgent hour of history. We become lukewarm. You know, it, it just compromise, apathy, lukewarmness, selfishness has come into the church. But I'm here to tell you that God is not going to end it that way. The Lord is, is absolutely going to have a church that is spotless and blameless and holy before he comes back. The church of Jesus Christ is going to be glorious and holy before he returns. But it's not just going to happen automatically. It's not just going to happen in the sovereignty of God. God is raising up uh, churches, ministries, ministers to be forerunners, anointed with the spirit and the power of Elijah. That means basically anointed with the Holy Spirit, with a prophetic anointing, with power from God to make the church what she's meant to be. The Lord is going to come back for a holy church, a glorious church, a church without spot, stain, or wrinkle, a church of first love for Jesus. A church who is, who is faithful to the Lamb, to follow him wherever he goes, even unto death. A church that loves the truth, speaks the truth, and is not compromised by false doctrine. A church who overcomes Jezebel and her influence in whatever arena in your life where you, where you might be affected by Jezebel. That, that he is going to have a church that is strong and disciplined. A church that is not asleep. A church that is on fire for him. He's not going to have a selfish, carnal, fleshly church. He's going to have an overcoming bride that is without spot, stain, or wrinkle. This is our mission. Amen. This is your mission. This is my mission. This is the why we exist. This is the why we gather to make the Lord's church ready. Man, how is desperately this is needed. Amen. There is only a very small remnant out there, and I'm talking about all over the world, a very, very small remnant that is actually going after the Lord to make ourselves ready. Revelation 19, 7. The bride makes herself ready. But it's going to increase. The Lord is going to have his church ready for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I believe that remnant is increasing and will increase as we fulfill our mission, as other churches with the same mandate and mission fulfill their mission. So our mission is to prepare this church and the global church to be a passionate, pure, and powerful bride. And then number four is our mission is to prepare the church to be a temple, a house, and a body. The Holy Spirit fully possesses and fills. See, the, the American church is made for people who want to fit Jesus into their life. The New Testament church is made for those who want Jesus to be their life. Let me say that again. The, the, the American church is uniquely designed for those who want to fit Jesus into their life. The New Testament church is about those who want Jesus to be their very life. There's a vast difference. The church is not an institutional organization under the government of soulish leaders. The church, that's why we prayed that prayer at the beginning, the church is the Lord's body, his ecclesia. See, when we come together, we're coming, we're not just going to church. When we come together, we're assembling together under the headship of Jesus Christ. I'm not the leader of this church. I'm not the head of the church. Dad is not the head of the church. Randall's not the head of the church. The elders are not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head of this church. And we're just following what he says. Do we do it perfectly? I'm sure we don't. I'm sure we do not do it perfectly. We probably don't even come close. But that is really our heart, is we're trying to follow the lamb wherever he goes. We don't want to do anything or say anything. or, or do, We don't want to do anything that's not him. We only want to do what he's saying. We only want to do what the Father is saying. So, see, God's original intention is for the church of Jesus Christ to be that organic expression of Christ indwelling life, operating together interdependently as one body. It's a beautiful thing. We've missed it. That the, because of the, the organized church and organized institutional religion and all this, we've missed the beauty of what the church is meant to be. And so our mission is to prepare this church and to prepare the global church to be a temple, house, and body the Holy Spirit fills and possesses. Amen. Okay. Our mission is fulfilled in an end-time context. We are living in the end times. We are an end time ministry. I'm not saying when Jesus is coming back. I don't know the timing of when he's coming back. I know we're living in the last hour. There, there's no doubt in my mind we are living in the last hour. I just think about even some of the signs that scripture says must be fulfilled before the Lord comes back. And I just think about all these things that have happened, you know, just, just a few of them, just to think about this. Israel became a nation in 1948 after 2,000 years of desolation. An incredible miracle that so many end-time prophecies depend upon Israel being a nation. The second one, Jerusalem becoming the capital of Israel in 1967. Again, so many prophecies about the end times depend upon that very reality. That happened in 1967. Number three, Daniel talks about knowledge and travel increasing rapidly. I mean, how, goodness, I mean, is that being fulfilled or what? I mean, it's like the knowledge, the amount of knowledge, even with AI coming out and some of this, some of this artificial intelligence coming out where you can just like type in a question and it writes out a whole letter for you that's perfectly intelligent. I mean, just, you know, where this is all going, I mean, we, that is definitely being fulfilled. Number four, the technology necessary for a one-world economy has been developed. I mean, this is already in place. The, the globalist elite are beginning to push for central bank digital currency and the, one, the control of money and all that means. And, you know, those, that technology is already in place to be fulfilled as the scripture has said. Number five, the, the Roman Empire is being restored through the European Union. And I think we're beginning to see that more and more and more. What... What, what scripture talks about. And then number six, lawlessness is increasing like never before. I mean, just, I think you can see that. I mean, it's, it's insane what people believe right now. It's, it's absolutely insane. I won't even mention some of the depravity that people are believing, but lawlessness is increasing like never before. 
And so I said all of that to make this point is that our mission is in an end time context. We are an end time ministry on mission to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I just wanted just to drill this into us is we are an end time ministry. Now, we're not date setters. We're not sitting here saying Jesus is coming back and, you know, remember the book 1988, 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. We're not that, but we are an end-time ministry, and we are an end-time ministry that is preparing the way for Jesus' return in this community, this nation, and the nations. So that's kind of, that is our mission. That's our mandate. That's the context in which we are living. So now what I want to do is I want to shift the focus now to talk about, okay, that in mind, here's some things we need to strengthen, okay? So as I talk about this, I want to share an analogy, okay? Some people might get offended. It's a good analogy, okay? John just did boo. He knows what's coming, okay? Dad's looking at me like about to vomit. Okay, it has to do with the G word, the George Bulldogs, okay? So I know if you're a Tech fan, if you're a Bama fan, an Auburn fan, a Florida fan, you're cringing inside, and I get it, I get it, I get it. So don't, turn, don't tune out this example, okay, because of your hatred for Georgia. We've become now the most hated college football team in America, um, except, for the, our, except for Georgia fans, and you know, that's, that's what winning does. Sorry, uh, just kidding. <laughs> But for real, for real, um, I do want to share this example because it, it'll help us understand just a little bit about the, the next part that's coming. It was uh, New Year's Eve when Georgia played Ohio State, and I'm sure a lot of us watched that game. It was an incredible game, and just the, the way Georgia won, 42 to 41. And, you know, Stetson Bennett, the former walk-on quarterback, just really he played, he played a, probably a B-minus game, but his fourth quarter was just un unbelievable. Through for like 200 yards, the, he led Georgia back to win. The only reason Georgia won was because of Stetson Bennett. And after the game, Kirby Smart was interviewed, the head coach, and, and they asked him, I said, so, you know, what do you want to say? He's like, well, Stetson needs to play better. He's like, if he plays like that, we're going to get beat. And I'm like going, come on, Kirby, come on. You just won this incredible game, and your quarterback played the fourth quarter of his life and you're saying he needs to play better. I'm like, come on. He says, if we play like that, we're going to get beat. And I'm thinking going, that just, okay, that just doesn't seem right. Come on, celebrate what just happened. That was an incredible performance in the fourth quarter. And I started, started thinking about that. I was like, you know what? He was right. He knows that Stetson Bennett was at his best when everyone doubted him, when everyone was like, okay, you can't do it. You, you need to improve. And, and so Kirby was challenging him for the next game. And you know what? Stetson Bennett played the absolute best game of his life as Georgia beat TCU 65-7. to seven. Threw for six, six, He accounted for six touchdowns, okay? And so my point is this. Okay, so hopefully if you hate Georgia, you can, you can, you can at least appreciate the analogy. Is, is sometimes... We need some coach speak, all right? Sometimes we need some, some challenges, not because, like, we're trying to make you feel bad, not because we're trying to bring condemnation. You know, it's different for a pastor because, you know, for a pastor, you obviously can't speak like a coach. You know, sometimes I wish I could, but I can't. Um, but sometimes there's that need to really say, okay, we need to, we need to step up some things if we want to fulfill our mission. And it's not doing it. So my heart in doing this is so we can complete our mission. I know you want that. And so sometimes we need to be exhorted. Sometimes we need to be exhorted onward in this. So that's really where I'm coming to you as, as I speak about this is, is really when I talk about this, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on some things, be, just be honest in some things. My encouragement to you is not to take offense. All right? Not to take offense. Guard your heart from taking offense, because the goal of this is for all of us to come together and to fulfill the mission God's given us, to win the game, to be champions, to be overcomers, all right? So that's where I'm coming from. Ryan. Yes, thank you, Shelly. Thank you. Yeah, Shelly said I look like very pastoral today, so I'm bringing the shepherd's rod here for a little bit. So, so 
some, some things to strengthen. Number one, the, one of the, the first thing we need to strengthen is, is uh, we've normally called them house group or home groups. I'm going to start calling it house church because home groups are not optional. You know, we, we have home group. We have ha- home group the last Sunday of every month. We don't have the bigger gathering here. We have church in the house. I'm going to start calling it house church because I want us to get the idea that this is still church. See, the, the, the New Testament church, they met in the temple and they met house to house. They met in the temple for the large corporate gathering and they met house to house. And Acts 2, 42 and 46 talks about they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. So we can say to the word of God, to the word of God, and to fellowship, community, hanging out, to the breaking of bread, communion, to prayer, waiting on the Lord, day by day. We're not there yet, but, you know, we're at least week by week. Continuing with one mind in the temple, large gathering, and breaking bread, communion, from house to house. They were taking their meals together, eating meals together, with gladness and sincerity of heart. The first century church. So as you go through this, this is really why we have church in the home. I think you need both. I think you need the larger corporate gathering, and you need that church in the home because you can't do all the things you're meant to do as the church, as the ecclesia, and the larger corporate gathering. And so we need to strengthen, we need to strengthen these house churches that we have. So just to review, what is the purpose of house church? Number one is to is fellowship. It's to create that community. We're going to need the community of the saints. We need it right now, but we're going to need it especially as we go deeper and deeper into the end times. We're going to need one another. We're going to need each other. Uh, the second one is discipleship, is studying the word of God together and discussing it so that, we can, so that we can really grow in the knowledge of the Word of God. You cannot grow in the knowledge of the Word of God just by me preaching. You've got to get into the Word, and you've got to think about it and meditate on it and get it into your heart and, and discuss it with other believers to, to learn for yourself. The, the next area is, is, is expressing Christ's life together. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. First Corinthians 14, 26. This is vastly different than what most church experiences are like, but this is one of the purposes of a home group. As Paul is saying, or a house church, is what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, when you gather, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. See, the, all the responsibility does not rest on the home group, the house church leaders, the pastors. It does not, does not rest upon them. Every one of us have that responsibility to bring something to the meeting. Just as like you're bringing food to the meeting, you're bringing something to this, to this home group, to this house church. You're bringing what the Lord has spoken to you. You're bringing what he's shown you in the word. You're bringing a revelation. You're bringing a teaching. You're bringing these things. The, the third purpose is pastoral care. And so let me talk about this. Turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul said, bear one another's burdens. Notice that is not one person doing all the work. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ, which the law of Christ, I believe, is love one another even as I have loved you. One of my roles as as the leader of this church is to help create a culture of the Lord Shepherd's heart that permeates this entire church. And my goal is to get to the place where I don't have to do any of it, but it's all being done by the body. That's really, that's really Ephesians chapter 4. And that doesn't mean I'm never going to do pastoral care. Don't get me wrong. But the role of the Ephesians 4 five-fold ministry, apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, evangelist, is not to do the work of ministry. 
not to do all the work of ministry. It's to equip the church to do the work of ministry. Okay, so just a little story here. Um, George and I were talking before church about our past, and we were having a friendly competition about whose past needed more redeeming. And I said, well, I think you're going to, I think I've definitely got you one. He's like, I'm not sure about that. So we had this kind of friendly competition. But I just made me think about when I was in high school and I got put on restriction for a month. I can't even remember what I did. I'm sure you, mom and dad remember. But I got put on restriction for about a month. And dad made me start doing all this yard work and all these different things around the house. And the next thing I knew, I had, the next thing they knew, I had about five or six of my friends over. And I had them doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I had them doing all the work. I was doing some too. And uh, not much, but I was making sure the work was getting done. I was making sure the work was getting done. And that month we won yard of the month. So you got to bear with me. That's just part of my DNA is I, I am a delegator, all right? So, but it's, it's really true. The, the idea of we grew up in the denominational church. We all probably grew up in some form of a denominational church where the, the senior pastor did all of the pastoral care and no one else did the pastoral care. It all rested upon the shoulders of one pastor. That is absolutely unbiblical. It is absolutely unbiblical. It's one of the reasons why pastors burn out because all the responsibility, they're taking on all the responsibility to do what is meant to be done by the body. The, the law of Christ, serving one another and bearing one another's burdens, is not meant to be fulfilled by one person, the pastor. It's meant to be the body fulfilling and carrying one another's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. You know, just to give you an idea, if, just to just want you to give you an idea of this, is I'm a, I'm a bivocational pastor. I have to work 25 hours a week in, a, in another job. And if I tried to do all the pastoral care, preach a message. By the way, this message took me about 12 hours to, to do. So, it, you know, some people think, like, doing a message is just a matter of, like, putting a few scriptures down and skidding up and talking. It just this took me about 12 hours. Not every message takes me 12 hours. I'm not trying to like make you a pity party. I'm just trying to give you just to give you an idea of, of things, and I, you know, do all the other things like write and lead and all the other things that the Lord has called me to do. I would totally burn out. My family would crumble. <laughs> it's not what the Lord is saying to do. So one of the purposes of these house churches is to appoint pastors. And by the way, I think it's really good that I'm bivocational because it kind of forces that issue that there's no way. I can do all the pastoral care and, and lead this church. That, that the, the work of the ministry is being delegated. And so that's why we appointed house church leaders. And house church leaders are pastors. So I want you to view them as a pastor. And they also need to take the same philosophy I take and, and equip you and your group to learn to care for one another. They should not be doing all the pastoral care. So you see... But someone's actually going to have, you know, five, it's going to go all the way down the, down the chain and it's going to be like five people at the end of the, not the, not, the chain, not the end of the chain, but five people down here being equipped. They're all doing it. And so we're all, you know, in our hammocks and whatever. That, I'm just kidding. But obviously the, the goal of these groups, one of the goals of these groups is, to, is for the pastors to do the pastoral care and to equip each group to care for one another, to take care. You know, if people are or in need, if people are, are sick or need, need something or have surgery or whatever it is, that, that, that we make sure everyone's needs and prayer requests and the body ministering to the body. That's what this is all about, just to get that, facil that facilitation going. Does that make sense? I just want to see, I want to see, um, I want to see our entire church. And I think, I think it is. I think, by and large, it's amazing the, the way everyone cares for one another. But I just want to just, you know, keep emphasizing over and over and over, that is why these home groups are. That's what one of the purposes are, is to provide that pastoral care so that, that everyone is bearing one another's burdens and the law of Christ is being fulfilled. Amen. All right. So some areas to improve. Okay, this does not apply to everyone. All right? So sometimes those who have a very sensitive conscience 
come under condemnation, all right? And they're doing everything that, that we need to do. So this does not apply to everyone. Just, just wherever that your heart is not in alignment, just let the Lord minister in that area. Number one is attendance. Is house church is church in the home. Okay, so I just, I just want to drill that into us. I think, I think sometimes we think house church, home groups is an optional meeting we can just skip. That's the one time per month. We, yeah, if we go, we go. It's not really church. No, house church is church. So attendance, it's not optional just because we don't meet in this building. It's, it's something that we're all called to go to and to be a part of. Number two, responsibility. Responsibility. Okay? These groups, you are respons- every one of us are responsible for the, the success of these groups. There's a responsibility in these groups. You're, you have a responsibility to do your part. Don't be a spectator. Be a participator. Don't do consumer Christianity. Be that living expression of Jesus Christ and his body. The body needs your contribution, whether it's your insight, whether it's a word, whatever it is. Do your part. Be part of that organic expression of Christ and dwelling life. Study the passages of Scripture that you're going to discuss. Don't cram. Don't cram. Seek the Lord for a word every time before you meet, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 26. That is your responsibility. It's not just to go eat a meal and listen to someone talk. You have a responsibility to get into the Word. Now, now a lot of us are doing that, but some of us aren't. Get into the Word, ask the Lord to speak, and then to share. And then the, the next area is participation. Come ready to share. Come ready to share. Don't make just a few people talk. If you're kind of introverted and shy, just be bold. Ask God to help you if you feel like intimidated. Just, just be bold and share what the Lord has called you to share. Fellowship. Make sure if you go to these groups, you talk to people. Part of these groups is to help build community. So if you're, not, if you're kind of introverted and shy, ask the Lord to help you. If you don't like doing this, ask the Lord to change you. Fellowship is important, all right? Serve, you know, bring food. And here's what I want to say. Listen to this. Offer to help your pastors with what they're doing. It's a lot of work for them, okay? It should not be, all the, all the burden and responsibility should not be on your pastors. Help organize the meals. Help coordinate the meeting. Clean up after, help them clean up after the home group. You know, just, just serve, and then, you know, the caring part is, you know, for the pastors, just want to encourage you, equip your church to do pastoral care, or equip your group to do pastoral care, and in the group, provide that pastoral care. How, how can we care for one another? How can we, you know, if someone's sick, how can we uh, help them with a meal? How can we pray for them? Be praying for your groups. Be praying for one another. Uh, if you don't know what group you're in, let me know. Okay, you still love me. Yes. Amen. Okay. It's not too bad, really, is it? Um, The next thing I want to say is, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10, verse 25. And the author of Hebrews is giving a scripture, an exhortation to the people of the first century, but it has a very specific application to the end-time church. Now, Listen to what they say, listen to what the author says, is not forsaking our own assembling together. So I'm going to talk about our gathering together, our gathering together. That would apply to the gathering together in this building three times a month and the gathering together in the house once a month. I want you to really hear this. This this really became alive to me a couple days yesterday, actually. Not forsaking our assembling together as is the habit of some. Notice it's a habit. I so appreciated uh, Larry's testimony when here is this man who is, his knee is killing him. He doesn't feel like going to church. A lot of us would just say, you know what? 
it's okay if I just stay home today. I'm not feeling good. But no, Larry pressed in, and the Lord spoke to him, go to church. And just the, I mean, you could tell he was touched by being here, being in the presence of God. See, what, what Hebrews 12, 10, 25 is telling us is not forsaking our assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Now, this is where I want us to really see, is all the more, all the more this is important as you see the day drawing near. This has very much an end time uh, application to it. As we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ, as we live in the end times, the ga- I want you to really, this is sink in, the gathering together of the ecclesia, coming under the headship of Jesus Christ, is essential. It's essential. Now notice Hebrews 10.25 didn't say, don't miss church regularly. But that's the way we read it, isn't it? Isn't that the way we read it today? Don't miss church regularly. He said, not forsaking our own assembling together. Now, when I started digging into this Greek word for forsake, it hit me and convicted me. It's a strong word. And I I want us to let the strength of this Greek word go into our heart. This word, you can look it up for yourselves, but it means to abandon, desert, leave behind. It means to leave in straits, to leave helpless, or to leave surviving. The idea is it leaves the church in a weaker state. The idea is when Larry, like for example, Larry this morning, if he would have said, my knee hurts, therefore I'm not going to come I mean, it seems like it would be a valid excuse to me, but the Lord said, no, go. If he would have stayed at home, he would have left this church in a weaker state. His beautiful singing brought us deeper into the presence of God. See, when when we we, um, decide not to come a particular Sunday, we're leaving the church in a weaker state. This reminds me of, like, just imagine is someone in the army says, I'm going to desert my unit. I'm going to forsake and abandon my unit. And you're going to have to fight this battle on your own. He leaves his unit in a weaker state. But he's comfortable. They're sacrificing. He's comfortable. That's really the idea this Greek word has. Okay? It's a strong Greek word. This is really strong. Again, this is not the Lord saying, don't miss church regularly on Sundays. It's you not, you not gathering together under the headship of Jesus Christ with the local ecclesia where God has planted you leaves that church in a weaker state. You're leaving the body to fight those battles alone as you sit at home in your PJs watching online. I wanted to sink in. Amen? Amen. It's one of the reasons why I had to send that email out last, last, yesterday. Is I'm telling you, we probably get like 15 or 20% more people coming when I send an email out like that. So I shouldn't have to do that. Okay? We're coach speak right now. I hope you still love me. We've got an end-time mission that's vital. We've got an end-time mission that's vital. We've got to have everyone part of this ecclesia together supporting this mission we've got. Now, of course, if you're sick, if your kids are sick, if you have an emergency situation, of course we're not telling you to come to church, okay? So don't don't go to the other extreme where you start coming and you got COVID and, you know, you get the whole church sick. That's not what I'm saying. Don't go to the other extreme, and start showing up with runny noses and, you know, you're getting everyone infected with the flu and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. And I'm not trying to create a culture of, like, you know, if you miss one day, you know, you're under this heaping condemnation. I'm trying to just establish the importance of the local church and the gathering together. It 
Amen. If I had to guess, okay, hope, hopefully you'll love me after this statement. Just say in your heart, I love Brian. <laughs> I love you. If I had to guess, though, I would say about 35% of us, probably like 34.73% of us, have a habit of missing church at least one Sunday a month or more, and I would include home group in that. Okay? So show the slide, Quentin. So this delighted up a little bit. I sent this out a couple weeks ago, but home alone. Eight-year-old Kevin McAllister was left home alone for three days, and he still made it to church. So, yes, you can make it to church this Sunday, all right? So just let that just get into your heart, all right? So experts say it takes about 60 days to form a new habit. And just remember, when, when, when you forsake the assembling together, the author of Hebrews says, you're doing it because it's a habit. So we want to reverse this habit, okay? It takes 60 days to form a new habit. So my challenge to you is this, is to say, I, for the next, I'm just going to say for the next three months, I am going to develop a habit of being, of being at church every Sunday, including home groups. Amen. 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 Okay, we're trying to win a championship. <clears throat> we're trying to fulfill our mission. Okay, number three, just say, I love Brian. I didn't hear it louder. I love Brian. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Shelly, why don't you make us some I Love Brian t-shirts? God forbid that I would ask this one thing. I bet you can probably guess what it is. Who said that? Yes. Be on time. Get to church on time. Okay, you still love me. Okay, so when we, just to give you an idea, okay. I don't have anyone in mind, but I would say when, whenever we start, and the praise team, I'm sure, can vouch for what I'm saying. Whenever we start church at 10, we probably have 10 or 15% of, maybe not much, 5%, 10% maybe, of everyone here. You know, there's maybe it's some in the, in the foyer, but, I, you know, when we start, we're, we're not starting. You know, a lot of times I wake up, I'm like, wow, I didn't know everyone was here. Or not when I get up here, I get up to speak. I'm like, wow, I didn't know everyone was here. Because when you start, it's a totally empty room. And I believe, you know, it, it might seem like a small thing to you, but I, I don't believe it's as small as you think it is. I really don't. I, I think it communicates readiness. I think it communicates we're ready to worship. We're ready to come together under the headship of Jesus Christ locally as a body. You know, and sometimes when visitors come, visitors always come, and they're, all, they're always like 15 minutes there before, you know, at least 15 minutes before the, the service starts. And when you start and there's just like me and the worship team and just two or three other people, I'm just like, this is a little embarrassing. <laughs> I'm glad there's no real a lot of visitors here today. But just, just to say that is I want us to, to be on time. It's not that, it really isn't that hard. I don't, I don't think, I just don't think it's that hard, really. I mean, if you're consistently seven minutes and 26 seconds late, set your alarm seven minutes and 26 seconds earlier. <laughs> I mean, for, I mean, I, I just, I don't think we would be late for work or late for a wedding, late for a movie, late for a doctor's appointment, late for school, okay? So, you, okay, this is, okay, so now we're going to open the door for pastoral counseling. So all the pastors, you're going to have to have pastoral counseling because I'm giving you permission to create a little strife in your family. If there's someone in your family that's consistently late, hold them accountable. 
Say, okay, we need to be at church by 10. Angie does that to me. Like, Angie says, we got to be here at 945, you know. And, you know, like last Sunday, she's like, hey, you're running late. You're running late. So I appreciate that. Okay, so hold your person accountable, your, your mate, your family accountable. You have my permission, okay? This is the last time I think I'm going to talk about being at church. This is the last time I'm going to talk about being on time. I, I, I don't like doing it. It's, it I, don't, I don't enjoy doing that. I'm sure you don't enjoy me saying it. But I really think it is important that it, it communicates something to, uh, to, to the Lord, to what we're about, to what we're doing, um, to the mission God has called us to, is that we, we are coming to this Sunday gathering uh, we're coming ready to gather together under the headship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, I think the other ones are, the, the next one's easier. Okay? Faithfulness in corporate prayer. Maybe it's not easier. Faithfulness in corporate prayer. So uh, on, on, on December 29th, the Lord gave me this word and just reminded me of what Josiah Bennett spoke as a word to this church in August of 2022. And his word was that, I mean, you know, he, he said a lot of things, but one of the, the main word he felt, and I talked to him beforehand, was the main, the main word he felt was that we're to be like the woman of Revelation 12 who is in travail, who gives birth through prayer and intercession to the man-child, or you could, I'm just going to say, to the overcoming son, so that mature representation of Jesus Christ, that we are to be a house of prayer that gives birth to this mature son that's going to be born at the end of the age, and that we need to have the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace that is in alignment with that. Like Hannah, who was in travail to give birth to Samuel, we are to be joined together in the place of prayer to give birth to this Samuel. Now, I know that everyone can't be part of our prayer time, so if you can't be part, I understand that. If, it, you know, if your schedule can, can make it, you know, I want to encourage you to come. So I know everyone, some people live far away, some people's schedules don't permit it. So this isn't like you know, trying to condemn anyone, so I know everyone's busy. But I do believe the Lord wants to stir up the corporate anointing to be a house of prayer. We really want to stir up that, that corporate anointing to be a house of prayer, to be a Hannah that cries out in prayer and travail for Samuel to arise, to be in travail that the John the Baptist would be born, that the man-child would come forth, that the bride would be made ready, that the overcomers would arise, that America would return to God's original intention as a nation, and for Israel to be a praise in the earth. That the Lord spoke this and said, rule in the midst of your enemies, and I want you to catch this, rule in the midst of your enemies and restrain the spirit of lawlessness at work in America. Now, now listen to this. So that your state and your nation, this is very, very important, so that your state and your nation will not align with the globalist in the World Economic Forum. If you don't know about them, you can go on our website and, and hear a message I talked about. Who are pioneering the Great Reset and the reestablishment of the revived Roman Empire. Now, I, I wrote, I, the Lord gave me that word on uh, December 29th. And I just found out this week, our governor is going to the World Economic Forum meeting this week. That, that is just awful. The, if you don't know their plans, you need to do some research on the Great Reset. I talked about that at the beginning of last year. It's going to fund, they want to fundamentally change the economy. They basically want to create global fascism. It, I believe it's the beginning of the Antichrist kingdom that is talked about in Scripture. But our, I had no idea when the Lord gave me that word to pray for your state that it doesn't align with the, with the World Economic Forum's globalist policies. I had no idea that our governor was going to that meeting. He's going there this week. We, you know, just that that those policies will not come into this state is not going to be good. It is not, it is, it is, I believe it is the Antichrist, I believe it's the rising of the Antichrist kingdom, the Antichrist system that is, that is comes before the Lord comes back. 
I, that, that would come to our nation and to our state. You know, we have a responsibility to restrain that in our state through prayer and intercession. So we need you. We need you in our prayer meetings. And again, if you're, I understand people that live far away and your schedules can't make it when we have it. I understand that. So I'm not trying to make you feel condemned. But if you can make it, we need you there because we have a lot to pray for. 2 Chronicles 29.11 is the word no man gave to us back in 1996 as part of our mandate to be a house of prayer. I'm just going to read this, read this scripture verse. Let me just turn there. I'm just going to paraphrase it. Is my sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to minister to him, to be his ministers, and to burn incense. I feel like the Lord is saying to us, Restoration Life, fulfill your mandate to burn incense at the golden altar of prayer to stand in the gap for life in your nation and state. So as we bring this message to a close, the Lord, I believe, is challenging us. He's coming back sooner than we think. We're deeper into the end of the age than we realize. Therefore, wake up. Strengthen the local church so we can together fulfill the mission God has given us as a body, as a people, under the headship of Jesus Christ. And love your pastor he may have challenged you in a few areas. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Lord, we just thank you for just what you're speaking. And uh, Lord, we just want to just say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Challenge our habits, Lord, that we have developed over years. Challenge our habits, I pray. Lord, my cry to you is that we together would be one body, united in purpose, fulfilling the mission you've given us, Lord, to make ready the bride of Christ. Lord, let us be that, that ministry, Lord, that makes ready the bride of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that helps fulfill your eternal purpose to see Jesus' place at the center of his church. Lord, to see uh, the church equipped as overcoming sons of God, to see the church made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ, to see the Holy Spirit get what he wants, a house, a temple, and a body he possesses and fills. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, in the end time context in which we live, Lord, we could fulfill that mission. Strengthen us and give us the power, Lord, to strengthen the local church so we can fulfill and complete that mission. And we pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen, amen, and amen. Okay, you can throw your tomatoes at me now in any time. So, just kidding.